chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following presentation is proudly sponsored by HalloweenCostumes.com. Your home this Halloween for the biggest selection of costumes in the world. For 20% off your entire order this month, click the promotional URL in the video description and stickied comment below to get your discount and let the folks at HalloweenCostumes.com know that Chilling Tales for Dark Nights sent you. Now, light up those jack-o'-lanterns, grab yourself a handful of trick-or-treat goodies, and prepare to be scared, because we're about to put you in the Halloween mood. <laughs> the show is about to begin. Ding! I jolted awake. My phone lit up on the nightstand. It showed one new notification. Motion detected at your doorstep. 3.17 a.m. My heart pounded as my fingers slipped across the screen. I clicked on the security camera video feed. A man stood on my doorstep. He stayed so still. I would have thought it was a photograph if not for the bugs fluttering by every few seconds. His body melted into the shadows around him, but his face shone brightly. Or, not his face, a white mask, and it was covered in blood. He stared straight at the camera, completely still, mouth twisted in a grin. It all started when I ordered the Halloween mask. Alicia and I decided to host the neighborhood Halloween party this year. I'd shelled out hundreds of dollars on plastic skulls, purple streamers, even one of those candy bowls with the animatronic hand in the middle. We still need to decide what to dress up as, my wife said as she neatly stacked the boxes in the corner. I was thinking maybe Morticia and Gomez? No, Ugh, that's cliche. Alicia rolled her eyes. So... What, if it's cliché? It's just a neighborhood party. It has to be perfect. Well, whatever it is, you better decide soon, because the party's next weekend. I scrolled through the costumes on HalloweenCostumes.com, looking for something terrifying. Something our neighbors would remember for years to come. Last year, the party was hosted by my rival neighbor, David Chandler. Mm, perfectly handsome BMW-driving David. My very own Ned Flanders, one-upping me on everything from lawn care to job promotions. Last year, he threw an incredible party, dressed as the clown. From it, he even jump-scared half the guests at various points throughout the evening. People were still talking about how awesome it was. I had to do better. What about that? Alicia asked, pointing to a plain white mask. It looked similar to a Michael Myers mask. White plastic forming the shape of a man's face with cutouts for the eyes and mouth. You could make it your own. Add blood or stitches or something. True. I added it to my cart, and after scouring the web for some promo codes, I didn't have much money left after all I'd spent on decorations, found a sketchy-looking website with what appeared to be a legitimate HalloweenCostumes.com promo URL displayed with the offer code worked into it. It read, HalloweenCostumes.com slash promo slash select your scare 20. Without thinking, I clicked it. As soon as I did so, I was redirected somewhere that was definitely not HalloweenCostumes.com. Damn it, I thought. Should have copied and pasted the link instead of clicking it directly. As I pondered how many viruses I'd just been infected with and before I could do anything else, a strange message popped up, taking up my entire screen. Code input successfully. Select your scare. One, two, or three. What the hell is this? I muttered. I tried to just click away from the dialog box, but it wouldn't disappear. Finally, 
against my better judgment. I clicked the first option just to make it go away. And I was happy to see I was back on the official HalloweenCostumes.com site with my items still in my shopping cart and the promo code successfully applied. I can't believe it, I thought. It actually worked. With that important Halloween-related task checked off my list but many things left to take care of, I went on with my day and quickly forgot all about the strange pop-up and eagerly waited my new mask. A few days later, I got an email telling me the package had arrived. October 29th, two days before the party. But when I got home, I found an empty doorstep. You didn't see a package? I asked Alicia. Didn't you get the notification? She asked, pinning up purple and orange streamers. We were the victims of a porch pirate. She pulled out her phone and handed it to me. Check it out. We have one of those security cameras by the door, mostly to avoid Bob, our resident traveling salesman, who seems to be selling something new every week. Whenever motion is detected, it pings our phones. Today, I've been swamped at work, though, and hadn't had a chance to look at it. I pressed play. I saw our doorstep and the brown cardboard box sitting on the doorstep. Behind it, on the sidewalk, was a figure in black. I watched as the man approached. He walked up my sidewalk with confidence, as if he lived there. As soon as he got close, close enough for me to see his face, he tilted his pale head down. Then he stepped onto my porch and, face still hidden, grabbed the package. He walked back down the sidewalk and disappeared. Why would he steal a package of Halloween costumes? Because your costume was just so amazing, he wanted it for himself. Alicia joked as she lined up bags of candy. It wasn't amazing yet. It was just the mask. I walked over to the table and helped her set up the candy. So we have two days, right? What else needs to be done? Well, we need to get new costumes, and I was thinking Morticia and Gomez. I sighed. Fine, we'll do it. I thought that would be the end of it. Some guy stole the package and that was it. We'd never see the mask again. I was sorely mistaken. As I sat at the table a few hours later, dumping candy into decorative bowls, a flash of motion caught my eye. I looked up and saw someone walking in our backyard at the edge of the woods. They were dressed entirely in black, walking along the perimeter of the forest, and the dusk light was hard to pick out any details about them, like their gender or their face. The only thing I could see was that they walked with slow, deliberate movements, and it looked like they were wearing a white mask. I heard Alicia's footsteps behind me and motioned her over. Alicia, look. There's someone in our backyard. What? Seriously? She joined me at the window. But by the time she did, the person had already disappeared into the forest. Huh. Well, I'm going up to bed, Alicia said. We can finish this tomorrow. I followed her up. Minutes after my head hit the pillow, I fell into a deep sleep until I woke up an hour later. I looked at the clock. 1.34 a.m. I pulled myself out of bed and trudged over to the bathroom, eyes blurred with sleep. The moonlight showed in from the window. I walked over to it, as if drawn by the light, and peered into the backyard below. I froze. At the edge of the backyard was a figure dressed in all black, wearing a white mask, facing our house, standing still as a statue. My heart pounded. I reached for my phone, then remembered it was still on the nightstand. I raced over and grabbed it, then looked back out the window. He was gone. The next day, in the flurry of getting ready for the party, I forgot about what I'd seen the night before. Around 6 p.m., I headed out to the party store to pick up some last-minute things. There, 
I received a text from Alicia. Well, that was odd in and of itself. I knew she had an important call with a client that evening. Confused, I opened the text. What it said made no sense. I'm glad you found your mask, but can you please stop? I'm on the phone with Evelyn. I quickly texted back. Stop what? She replied. Stop tapping on the window. It's super annoying. I stared at my phone, panic seeping in. Then my fingers raced across the keyboard as I typed. I'm not at home. I'm at the party store. She did not reply. I grabbed my stuff and ran out to the car, phone pressed against my ear. I breathed a sigh of relief when she answered. Ben, I told you I'm on the phone. Alicia, I'm not home. Whoever you're seeing out there isn't me. You need to call the police right now. Memories of the figure I'd seen the night before rushed back to me and I shuddered. But call the police! I yelled. When I arrived home, the police were already there. Red and blue lights flashing in the darkness of our driveway. Alicia stood in the driveway, giving her statement, somewhat begrudgingly. All I saw was someone in a black hoodie, black pants, and a white mask with fake blood all over it. They were over there at the office window. You didn't recognize anything about them? The tall, lanky officer asked. I thought it was my husband, but he was at the store, apparently. Look, I am sure it's just some teenager from the neighborhood playing a mischief night prank. And if it is, she said, giving me a stern look as I walked over, I don't want to press charges. We were all young and dumb once. The officer laughed at that, an annoying, high-pitched laugh that grated my eardrums. We'll take a look around and follow up with you, Mrs. Breslaw, he said. Thank you. Alicia turned to me, arms crossed, lips pressed into a line. Great. You've just wasted 20 minutes of my time. Evelyn is so pissed that I got the call short. There was some creep tapping on your window. I shouted back. What? You wanted to just ignore it? Obviously just some teenager. I mean, come on. It's mischief night. I'm just happy it was that and not getting TP'd. Ugh, it takes forever to clean up. Okay, fine. I hurried past her and set my supplies on the table. Then I set to work ripping open packs of plastic spiders and bats. They fell onto the table with a loud, gross plop. I'm going upstairs, Elisa said curtly, leaving me to prepare for the party on my own. Ding. Motion detected at your doorstep. 3.17 a.m. The notification came through on my phone loud and clear. I tapped on the video feed, half asleep. A man stood on my doorstep. He wore all black. Covering his face was the white mask I had ordered, covered in something dark. I jumped out of bed. Alicia! I whispered, shaking her awake. Alicia, he's back! What? She murmured. The man in the mask, he's back! He's standing on our porch right now and... Is he TPing in the trees? No! Then let me sleep! She groaned rolling over and throwing the covers over her head. I know lots of crazy things happen on Mischief Night, but this... this crossed a line. A big line. A man standing on my porch in the middle of the night, wearing the mask I'd ordered? Probably the same man who'd stolen the mask in the first place, right off my doorstep. Well, this was too far. I crept out of the room and peered down into the foyer, through the glass insert in our door, I saw him. He stood under the porch light, blurred and distorted through the glass, but I could still make out the white mask, stained red with blood. Should I call the police? Alicia would be mad at me. Screw it, this was too far. My fingers slipped over the screen. There's a man standing on my porch in a mask, I said my words coming out as a jumbled string of syllables. As soon as the call ended, the figure shifted. Then it receded, until all that remained was the empty porch. I clicked back to the security camera feed. It too showed nothing but the empty porch and the shadows of the front yard. 
A sharp knock on the door tore me from my thoughts. I looked down to see two figures distorted through the glass. Two figures wearing blue uniforms. I let the police in and explained everything. I even showed them the security footage. They searched the backyard, but they didn't find anyone. When they finally left, I retreated back into the bedroom. Alicia, thankfully, somehow slept through it all. I locked the door and dragged a dresser over it for good measure. Then, I collapsed into the bed. I didn't fall asleep until the sky brightened with dawn, and the birds began to sing. Aren't you excited for the party? I stared out the window like a soulless zombie. I'd slept all of three hours, and the fatigue felt like a train driving over me, again and again. But I couldn't nap. There was so much to do. Spider cupcakes and monster fingers to bake. Decorations to hang. Candy bowls to put out. Will you hang these streamers in the office? Alicia asked, handing me a tangled mess of black, orange, and purple. But no one will be going in there. She quirked an eyebrow at me. You told me you wanted this to be the best party ever. That you wanted every single room decorated. Just in case. Okay, okay, I said, forcing myself out of the chair. I took the streamers from her and entered the office. There, on the desk, was the mask. Mouth twisted into a smile. Gaping holes for eyes, dark red splattered across the plastic. Alicia, I shouted. She rushed into the room. Where... Where did you get this mask? I stuttered, breathless. It was on our doorstep this morning. Relief flooded through me. He wasn't in the house. It was just on the doorstep. My entire body shook as I fell into the chair. Why don't you rest for a bit before the party starts? Alicia said, laying a hand on my shoulder. I'll call you down when everyone's here. I nodded. Alicia thought I was overreacting. Maybe she was right. Maybe I was letting a mischief night prank by some dumb teenager mess with my head. I lay down on the bed, ignoring the dings of my phone on the nightstand, and closed my eyes. It seemed like only seconds passed before Alicia was back in the room, asking me to come downstairs. Everyone's here, she said, and they want to see you. I followed her down the stairs and froze. Every single person in the room wore the mask. Black clothes with that white mask over their faces, covered in splatters of blood, gaping eye holes, a twisted mouth. I felt dizzy. The room pitched before me and I gripped the banister for balance. Ben. Are you okay? I swayed, trying to steady myself. Why? Why are they all wearing that? They said you asked them to. What? You didn't? No, I said as the crowd blurred before me. They said you left the masks with a note saying they should wear them to the party. A lot of people canceled because of it. Families with kids, mostly. She turned to me. You really didn't do it? Why would I? Alicia shrugged. Uh, I don't know. You were uh, obsessed with this party from the beginning and, and the mask. I, I th thought maybe... She trailed off. If you, you didn't put the masks in their mailboxes... Who did? Him. The man who had been tapping on the window. The man who had been standing on our porch last night. The man who stole my mask. As my mind swirled with questions, who he was, why did he do this, the memory popped into my head. The promo code and the select your scare message. Had I somehow chosen this? I stared into the crowd. Fifty masked faces stared back at me, all identical. Anyone could be him or no one. 
Before I could think, a hand pulled me into the crowd. Ben, hey, how's it going? A familiar voice asked behind the mask. Eddie Huntley, the blonde-haired man that lived three houses down the street. <sighs> it's good, <laughs> I said, faking a smile. He continued to talk, but I only pretended I was listening. He looked across the crowd. All the masked faces were turned towards each other, bobbing and nodding in conversation. Except for one. One who was staring right at me. I broke away from the conversation. Hey, hey, hey! I shouted, pushing through the crowd. His gaping eyes stared back at mine, soulless and empty. I grabbed the mask and ripped it off, and stared into the face of Mary Chandler, the wife of my rich, luxury-loving neighbor. Ben, great party. Love the masks, she said in her elegant, soft voice. Really adds a creepy flavor to the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> thanks, I stuttered. Hey, have you seen David? It seems I've lost him. I shook my head. She continued staring into the crowd. Ding! My phone chimed. I slowly pulled it out of my pocket and looked at the screen. Motion detected at your doorstep. 8.32 p.m. I tapped on the camera feed. There he stood. David? Who else could it be? He was missing. And there was the masked man. Standing on my porch. Heart pounding, I fought my way through the kitchen, through the family room, and over to the front door. Now the porch was empty. I opened the door and stared out into the night. But beyond the halo of light the porch created, everything was a murky mess of shadow. I shut the door. The lights flickered. And then they went out. The room plunged into darkness. Shouts and murmurs sounded across the party. Masked faces whirled about it in confusion. Turn the lights back on! A woman shouted angrily. Cell phone flashlights flicked on, twinkling among the crowd of shadows. Ding! Motion detected at your back door, 8.35 p.m. I stared at my phone in horror as I heard the back door creak open, followed by heavy footsteps. I ran through the family room and into the kitchen. The back door hung open, but he was gone, blended into the crowd. Stay calm, I told myself. Get the power back on, then you can deal with finding the culprit. My head pulsed with pain as I considered the two options. Either someone flipped the master breaker, or someone cut the power lines. I decided to check the master breaker first. Alicia, I said, fumbling my way in the darkness towards her. Thank goodness she wasn't wearing a mask like the rest of them. Keep everyone calm, okay? I'm going to check the breakers in the basement. Oh, okay, she said, biting her lip. You, th you think maybe the fog machine was drawing too much power? Uh, yeah. No need to get her worried. Using my cell phone as a flashlight, I stumbled to the basement door. I opened it. The stairs loomed before me, stretching into the pitch black shadow below. A shudder ran through me. Maybe it was just the fog machine, I muttered to myself, descending the steps one by one. We had a menagerie of Halloween decorations out on the lawn, and it was possible that they blew the fuse. Then why would the whole house be without power? I forced the question out of my head and continued down the stairs. I made my way to the breaker box, my footsteps clicking against the cement. The master breaker was flipped. Someone intentionally walked into the basement and flipped the switch. My heart pounded in my chest. My hand shook as I reached out and flipped the switch back. The lights flicker to life, including the light bulb above my head. For a second, silence. Then someone grabbed me roughly from behind. I whipped around, thrashing against strong arms. A white mask stared back at me, 
smeared with blood, gaping, empty eye sockets. I tore away and jumped back. My body collided with my workbench. My eyes scanned it. There. There was my hammer, lying on the wood. I grabbed it. The figure jumped forward. Laughter echoed from beneath the mask along with a voice. I got you this- I lifted the hammer and smashed it into his skull. The man immediately crumpled. He fell onto the floor, head smacking against the tile. I crouched over him. Then I reached over and pulled the mask off. It was David. Footsteps sounded behind me, then shouts, then screams. Call 911! Someone cried. But David was perfectly still. The police carried him out in a body bag. The guests were gone. The masks were strewn across the floor, the couch, every room of the house. A few were completely crushed, stepped on in the chaos. The back door still hung open, letting in gusts of cold October air. I didn't sleep a wink that night. The image of David's face burned into my mind. I'd heard his wife explain to the police in broken sobs that he'd been planning some sort of prank on me at the party. He hadn't visited the house or stalked Alicia. He'd only planned to scare at the party. She didn't know what it was until the lights went out. He was innocent. I spent half the day sleeping, the other half drunk. When night rolled around, Alicia pulled me off the couch. Sit on the porch with me, she said. Why? It isn't good for you to be inside all day like this. I followed her out, beer in hand. We sat on the back porch facing the forest. Ben, you can't, um... You didn't mean to, she forced out, glancing in my direction. No. I didn't mean to. The funeral's in three days. Maybe we should go. She reached over and squeezed my hand. I don't know if I can face Mary, I said, stumbling over my words. Or any of them. I... My words caught in my throat. There, on the edge of the tree line stood a familiar figure, dressed in all black, wearing a white mask, splattered with blood. I stood up. Alicia grabbed my hand, but I yanked it away. Get the hell off my property! I screamed. The figure didn't budge. Fueled by alcohol and anger, I leapt off the porch and strode across the backyard. Ben, please don't! Alicia called after me. Take off your fucking mask! I screamed, closing in on the figure. He still didn't move. A man is dead because of your fucking games! Alicia jogged after me, turning on her cell's flashlight. Ben, stop, please! But I didn't stop. I didn't stop until I was inches from his face. But I could smell his sordid breath in the air. Take off your fucking mask! I growled. I want to see who you are before I smash your stupid little head! He just stared at me with those gaping eye sockets. Plastic mouth twisted into a smile. Oh, you don't believe me. You should. I killed someone last night, smashed his head right in. I'm a murderer now. You hear that? I leaned in, my face inches from his. I killed someone because of you! And I'll kill you too if you don't take that fucking mask off! He didn't move. Fine! I shouted, spittle flying from my mouth. I'll take it off myself then! I reached up, grabbed at his jawline, pulled. It didn't come off. I stumbled forward, grabbed harder, pulled harder. No, 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 no. I took a step back, my heart pounding. It wasn't a mask. 
I watched in horror as his mirthful grin contorted into an angry scowl. Run. Run! I screamed, taking off across the grass. Alicia followed, screaming her lungs out. I whipped around to see the figure chasing us at full speed across the lawn. I ran as fast as I could. I didn't stop until I was inside the house, closing the door. That's when I realized... Alicia had stopped screaming. The backyard was empty. Both of them were gone without a trace. Except for Alicia's phone in the grass. The flashlight shined up towards the sky, shimmering and sparkling in the shadows. I haven't seen Alicia since that night. It's been a week. I didn't attend David's funeral, though I suppose I am now in the same boat as Mary Chandler. Her husband is gone. So is my wife. The police suspect that I killed David on purpose. After all, our playful little rivalry was well known among the neighbors. They also believe I had something to do with Alicia's disappearance and to fill in a motive for me. Rumors are flying that Alicia and David were having an affair. I've been advised not to leave town, so as much as I would love to leave this all behind, I'm stuck here. With my guilt. With my past. I leave you with a warning. The masked man, whatever he is, is still out there. And so, I beg you. Don't trust anyone who wears a mask, who hides their face behind a grotesque facade of plastic, because it might not be a mask after all. I hope you enjoyed The Halloween Mask, co-authored by Blair Daniels and Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's creator, Craig Groshek. As a reminder, tonight's presentation is brought to you by HalloweenCostumes.com. You're home this Halloween for the biggest selection of costumes in the world. If you're looking for the best Halloween costume ideas for this year's festivities, HalloweenCostumes.com's got you covered. Whether you're searching for a costume for All Hallows' Eve itself, or need the perfect outfit to wear to your upcoming murder mystery party, their costume selection is larger than any other Halloween store in the industry. With HalloweenCostumes.com, the perfect Halloween costume is only a couple of clicks away. And this month, for a limited time, they're offering those of you in our listening audience 20% off your entire order. To get the discount and let our sponsor know we sent you, just click the promotional URL in the video description and stickied comment below and proceed as usual. Or visit HalloweenCostumes.com slash promos slash select your scare 20. That's HalloweenCostumes.com slash promo slash select your scare 20 for 20% off your entire order. Your savings will be reflected during the checkout process. Now that we've ensured your Halloween costume this year will be the best ever, courtesy of our friends at HalloweenCostumes.com, allow me to ignite your imagination with another eerie tale. Stay tuned, if you dare. <laughs> I don't celebrate Halloween. When the trick-or-treaters come out and start prowling my street, I make sure to keep my front porch light off and pull the shades down. If someone rings my doorbell despite all my precautions, I hide in the bedroom and pray that they don't ring it again. There is always a fear that maybe it's not a child in a ninja turtle mask or wearing a sheet over their head. Maybe. Just maybe. It's Granny Clark. Granny Clark is the reason I stopped celebrating Halloween. Abigail Clark, known to everyone in Hollisfield as Granny Clark, was the kindest, sweetest old lady in existence. She lived in a little green house at the top of Tamarack Lane, one that bordered a broad expanse of forest. She'd lived there as long as anyone could remember. Someone once told me she was over a hundred years old, and nobody within earshot challenged the claim. 
I absolutely believed them. Juniper Street, the street I lived on, just happened to touch that same forest as Granny Clark's. There was a path that wound through the woods all the way up the hill to her driveway. Many an afternoon was spent playing in those woods, climbing trees, building forts out of sticks, or running down that winding path from Granny Clark's driveway to the end of Juniper Street, pretending wolves were biting at my heels. I always felt somewhat unnerved being around Granny Clark. Maybe it was the way she walked, all hunched over, her arms bent at the elbows like a Tyrannosaurus. Or maybe it was her shock white hair that stuck out in all directions. Maybe it was the way I could see her blood vessels clear as day through her translucent, liver-spotted skin, the way her fingers seemed unnaturally long and thin. My mother took me to see her once when I was seven. They were coordinating together on an arts and crafts table at the local fair. I remember that her little green house smelled like lavender and mothballs, and the rooms were lined with photos of children. Some of the photos were in black and white, or faded like they'd been taken many years ago. Are these all your kids, Miss Clark? She smiled and looked around the room. These are all my lovely babies. Afterwards, as my mother and I walked down the path to Juniper Street hand in hand, I told her how amazing I thought it was that one person could have so many children. She just laughed at me. They aren't really her kids, Will. Miss Clark doesn't have any children of her own. Those were photos of other people's kids. Why does she have photos of other people's kids? Because their parents gave them to her. Did you give her my photo? Not yet. I looked up at my mother with concern. Please don't. She frowned, but said nothing the rest of the walk home. Five years later, I got permission to go trick-or-treating with my friend Spencer on Halloween. Spencer lived over on Rosemond Avenue, a street which connected with a number of others, including Tamarack Lane. The neighborhoods over and around Rosemond were considered the best area for trick-or-treating in my town, far superior to the neighborhood down around my neck of the woods. Together, we convinced both our parents that we were old enough to go on our own. What I didn't know at the time was that Spencer had other plans. When my dad dropped me off at Spencer's doorstep in my pirate costume, complete with eye patch, black marker goatee, and stuffed parrot velcroed to my shoulder, Spencer was already outside, sitting on the front stoop. He was going as either a zombie or an accident victim, I never really asked. His clothes were all torn and covered in stage blood, and he used some sort of wax to create open sores on his arms and face. I was genuinely impressed with the amount of work he'd put into making himself look grotesque. Once my father's car rolled out of sight, Spencer grabbed me by the arm and hauled me around the side of his house to the garage. Listen, Will. You have to help me pull something off. It better not be your pants. Spencer gave me a serious look. Ha <laughs> ha. Josh dared me to prank old Granny Clark. Josh Gurry was a kid in our grade who Spencer had a habit of butting heads with. They'd had a rivalry ever since Spencer pinned Josh in under a minute during gym class wrestling. Since then, Josh always tried to make Spencer look weak in front of the other kids our age, and Spencer refused to ignore it whenever he did, probably as a matter of pride. Granny Clark? I didn't like the idea of doing anything to anyone, let alone an elderly person. Spencer saw the concern in my eye. We're not going to do anything serious. What, what were you planning? Spencer smiled. It's simple. You distract her by trick-or-treating at the front door. Just keep her talking. I'm going to go in the back. No way! I'm not going to be an accomplice in breaking and entering. It's not breaking in, Will. She always leaves her back door unlocked. That seemed like an odd thing to know. Anyway... I'll go in the back, sneak upstairs, and toilet paper her entire bedroom. As if to prove the legitimacy of the plan, Spencer pulled a large roll of bathroom tissue out of his trick-or-treat bag. What will that prove to Josh? That you can TB some half-blind old lady's house? Are you gonna help me or not? Because you can always walk home if you want. We stared at each other through our makeup effects for a few moments before I sighed and gave in. But promise we'll do a bit of trick-or-treating, too. 
Otherwise, my parents will know we're up to something. Of course. I want candy, too. <laughs> Jeez. With that, we set out. Trying not to seem obvious, we meandered around the neighborhood for a half hour, letting the sun set and waiting for most of the other trick-or-treaters to finish going down Tamarack Lane, trying to reduce the chances of someone spotting us. I got some candy to get started on my alibi in case I was questioned later as to my involvement in scaring an old lady to death. My stomach was very unhappy with me, and it made it known by clenching up like a fist. I was hot in my pirate costume, but my whole body shook with anxiety. Finally, when the streetlights had turned on, and all the very small goblins and fairies were carted off back to their homes, Spencer nudged me in the ribs and nodded silently in the direction of the forest. I nodded back, and we made a beeline for Tamarack Lane, trying to make small talk to continue looking inconspicuous. When we got to the end of Tamarack Lane, Spencer threw his arm out, stopping me in my tracks. We both stood, looking at the little green house at the top of the hill. The front porch light was off. No! Welp, she's in bed. Abort mission. I started to turn when Spencer grabbed my arm. Wait. I think I see her moving about in the kitchen. There was someone moving around in the kitchen. I couldn't make out who it was just a silhouette pacing around in the back of the house, right near the door Spencer was planning to sneak in through. Spencer reached into his trick-or-treat bag, fumbling around for a minute before pulling something out and shoving it into my chest. Here. Take this. I took what he handed to me and looked down at it. A walkie-talkie? Are you serious? Stick it in your candy bag, then go ring the doorbell. And if you can't keep her busy, just reach in and click the button on the front twice. I'll hear it and bail. Dude, the porch light is off! Spencer looked at me, and I saw the desperation in his eyes. He had to prove himself to Josh in this stupid, juvenile, ridiculous way. And if I didn't help him, he was probably going to do something even dumber. Or worse yet, in his mind, go back to school and confess to Josh that he didn't do it. I sighed and dropped the walkie-talkie into my bag. Just go and get it done quick. Granny Clark gives me the creeps. Spencer ducked down low and crept off into the trees and bushes by the side of the road. He was out of my sight in an instant, though I heard him shuffling around, snapping twigs and cursing as he stumbled through the dark. And then he was gone. I looked up at the little green house. It seemed bigger and a darker shade of green than it had before. Though I knew it was more my mind playing tricks on me than anything real. Through the window, the silhouette of Abigail Granny Clark shuffled around in her kitchen, occasionally disappearing out of sight around the corner, only to shuffle past in the opposite direction a moment later. I ascended the front porch steps, my right hand sliding into the candy bag to feel the walkie-talkie and make sure it was face up for easy access to the emergency button on the front. My pirate makeup was probably starting to run down my face due to the sudden sweat I'd built up on my forehead. The stuffed parrot on my shoulder felt like it was getting heavier. Somewhere, deep inside me, a little voice whispered, I don't want to be here, over and over again. I felt certain I was going to hurl at any second. Time to man up. Shut up. I hesitated to push the doorbell button. Trembling in fear, my finger hovered there in front of it for a solid minute. <laughs> my heart lurched at the sound of the walkie-talkie. I clutched my chest and gritted my teeth, knowing Spencer was sending me a signal. Okay, okay. As I approached the door, I became horribly aware of the sound of banging and thumping inside the house. <coughs> I rang the doorbell. The sound of busy work inside the house stopped suddenly, and silence settled over the house. I wondered if I should ring the doorbell again. The sound of their approaching footsteps served to fill my tankard of dread even further. There was a hesitation in them, like Granny Clark wasn't sure what to do. Or maybe she was waiting to see if I'd leave. 
I found myself hoping she would open the door. I really didn't want to have to ring the doorbell again. Just then, the porch light came on, and I froze. It was like being cast suddenly in a spotlight. There I was for all to see. Through the small, semicircular window in the door, I caught a brief glimpse of someone looking out to see who had rung the bell. I couldn't make out her eyes, just her eyebrows in the darkness. With the door open, I found myself face to face with Abigail Clark. She looked haggard. Her eyes were sunken and hidden in shadow. Her features were even more pale than usual, and her whole face seemed to hang off her skull. She had pulled a shawl over her head, hiding most of her shock white hair. I could only see a few strands hanging down in her face. I swallowed the lump burning in my parched throat. When I finally found the courage to speak, I squeaked out the words, uh, Um, hi. Trick or treat. Granny Clark didn't say a word. She just stood there, not moving, staring at me with her dark eyes and that sickly-looking face. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of movement behind her in the kitchen, and I knew Spencer had entered the house. I needed to fill the silence or he'd be busted for sure. <coughs> <coughs> I blinked several times trying to think of something to say. Miss 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 Clark, I I'm I'm sorry if we if I woke you. Oh no. I realized I'd said we. My mother insisted I stop by and say hello while I'm out trick or treating tonight, and I almost forgot it. I knew she'd be disappointed if I went home tonight and told her that I hadn't paid you a visit, so I'm hoping to spite your light off you'd be Granny Clark stepped halfway out onto the porch. As she did so, I noted the heavy brown coat she wore. I also noticed a pair of thick gloves on her hand. She seemed to straighten and turn, reaching behind the door jam for what I assumed was a bowl of candy. Are you, you having trouble with the heat in your house, Miss Clark? I could hear myself, and it sounded like I was going to cry. Why wasn't she speaking? One gloved hand beckoned me closer. Her every exhalation gurgled like a diver using a snorkel. The expression on her face never changed. There was no sign of the joy or excitement that I'd seen every time I'd visited her in the past. She seemed like an entirely different woman, and I felt sensations of discomfort and fear battling each other in my gut. I stepped closer, holding my bag out. A disturbance in the back of the house broke the awkward silence. Granny Clark and I both stiffened. Oh no, I thought. Granny Clark turned her head in the direction of the kitchen, where Spencer seemed determined to make as much noise as he possibly could. It sounded like he had started having a seizure back there and was flopping around on the kitchen tiles, slapping everything in sight. Panic lurched in the pit of my stomach. It felt like my eyes were going to bulge out of their sockets as I tried to think of anything to say in this situation. My mind blanked with the single word, GO, flashing like a neon sign in the center of my brain. Without another word, I turned away to make a hasty retreat. Granny Clark's heavily gloved hand clamped down around my wrist. For being over a hundred years old, she had a grip like a lumberjack. She squeezed so tight my legs turned to gelatin, dropping me to my knees. I cried out in pain as I grabbed at her hand. Ow! Miss Clark, you're hurting me! Her other hand, behind the door jam, appeared, holding not a bowl, but a large box cutter. She extended the blade, looking at me with the same emotionless expression, and pulled me closer to her. The whole moment was so surreal that I just knelt there on the front porch as she dragged me towards her, trying to understand what was happening. Why was she holding a box cutter? Where was the candy? What was going on? Run! Granny Clark turned again in the direction of the kitchen as she caught sight of Spencer dashing past, throwing open the back door and disappearing into the backyard. In doing so, her grip loosened on my wrist ever so slightly just enough for me to twist my arm and squeeze through her fingers. She turned back to me, 
grasping at me with her free hand, while the other one holding the box cutter arched back threateningly. Even then, kneeling on the porch, watching the kindest old woman in town come at me, the blade of the box cutter glinting from the streetlights, I tried to rationalize the situation. This wasn't the Granny Clark I knew. I looked up at her, trying to find the words to calm her. Please, please, Miss Clark, don't kill me. It was just a joke, I'm sorry, please. I scrambled back a foot. The left half of Granny Clark's face seemed to sag like it was melting. Her eyes looked funny, droopy. She brought the blade down, and I instinctively raised my hands to protect myself. The edge of the box cutter sliced through the fabric of my costume and opened the flesh of my arm. I did not give her a second chance. My legs that had initially surrendered to gravity now felt the intense burn of adrenaline pumping through them. Tucking into myself, I rolled backwards trying to gain my footing only to end up tumbling down the front porch steps instead. White hot pain shot up my left side, but I refused to pause. I was too driven by blind panic. I got to my feet in a hurry as the old woman on the porch straightened up, towering over me like a giant. Granny Clark tromped down the steps with a frightening determination. Spencer, eyes wide with terror, came around the corner of the house at full tilt. He surveyed the scenario unfolding on the front porch, and a look of confusion washed over him for a second, before he grabbed me by the arm and spun me around. Make for the woods! And with that, Spencer was off like a shot, sprinting to the end of the driveway where the forest began. I ran, hot on his heels, my arm and my head both throbbing. Dizziness and nausea swept over me and I tripped over my feet, colliding with the side of Granny Clark's car. How had everything gone so wrong? Before I could collect my thoughts, I heard the heavy thud of boots and looking back, saw Granny Clark's hulking form lurching towards me. Silhouetted by street lamps in her heavy coat with a shawl over her head, she looked massive like a lumbering horror, hell-bent on my destruction. Nobody's gonna believe this, I thought. Even I don't believe it, and I'm seeing it. I shook it off and bolted for the tree line. I knew that if I could just make it to Juniper Street, I'd be safe. The trail was a winding quarter mile, but it was all down a hill, and I had enough terror-based energy pumping through my veins to keep me going. I'd run that path for years, and I knew every gnarled root that might trip me up, every change in the angle of the descent, every curve to avoid a tree in the dark. Just. Get. Home. The moon was out, and it filtered through the branches, making beams in the dust kicked up by Spencer before me. It highlighted the path and cast the forest in a creepy blue hue. Everything around me seemed to glow. If I hadn't been running for my life, I might have stopped to take it in. The adrenaline coursing through me made time slow to a crawl. Every footfall felt like I was slogging through thick mud. I've never been as perfectly attuned to my senses as I was sprinting through the forest that Halloween. I could hear everything around me. My breath coming out slow and focused my heart thumping in my ears, the snapping of branches further down the path as Spencer, less familiar with the way, ran ahead, and the heavy clumping of someone coming down the trail behind me. I turned to look. I did it, knowing all the stories of people being told not to look back and all the bad things that happened to them when they did. I did it, not wanting to see what it was because I knew I did it and all my hopes of making it home disappeared in a flurry of wings like a flock of startled pigeons. Granny Clark was right behind me, thundering down the trail like a rampaging elephant. She was a good twenty paces back, but I could see her perfectly in every sliver of moonlight we both ran through. The most frightening thing about her was the look on her face. It wasn't one of anger, or even of determination. In fact, there was no expression whatsoever. Her eyes were dead. Her mouth seemed to hang open. The left side of her face still sloughed down like melting candle wax. And then, the wind whipped her shawl off. And her face went with it. It just slid down as easily as a Halloween mask, disappearing somewhere on the trail behind her as she closed in behind me, as determined and frightening as ever. 
where the face had been, there was just blood, just blood everywhere. But I could finally see her eyes through it all, and they stared at me with a terrible rage and madness like I had never seen before. I thought I was going insane. She bore down on me, the sight of her hate-filled, bloody face burning forever into my mind. Her hands reached out, trying to grab me and guide me to hell. But all I could focus on was that scarlet face, the true fury within her finally revealed. There was a sharp turn in the path, and I slowed for only a fraction of a second to make it. Granny Clark was not as familiar with the trail, her momentum driving her straight on. Her fingers licked past the back of my head and wrapped around the stuffed parrot on my shoulder. She can have the parrot, I thought. She tore it off just as she barreled headlong into the trees behind me, crashing to a stop with violent abruptness. When I burst out of the woods and onto the tarmac of Juniper Street, I was moving like all hell was on my heels. Ahead, I saw Spencer slowing down, trying to catch his breath as he reached the driveway to my house. Somewhere along the way, he'd lost his own trick-or-treat bag, and most of his makeup had run off. Don't stop! He turned, seeing me hurtling down the road, and hurried up to the front door. Let me in! Let me in! Open the door, please! Let me in! Help! I dashed up the front sidewalk, shoving him aside and throwing my shoulder into the door, having just enough sense to turn the knob and open it. We fell over each other on the landing and Spencer kicked futilely, trying to close the door behind him. I climbed over him to get to the door. With my full weight against the door, I broke down into tears while clutching my arm. Oh my god! This is all your fault, Spencer! You and your stupid ideas! I never should have gone along with it! Whatever, Will! You outed me when I was in the back! Everything was going fine until you had to go and screw it up! Me? I can't believe you! It's you that almost got us killed! You and your stupid, stupid schemes! I'm so sick of you, Spencer! I'm sick of you! We're done, Spencer! I don't need friends like you! Fine! Good riddance! My mom and dad, hearing the commotion, ran in from the living room to find us yelling and bloody. They looked us over with mild annoyance until my mom saw my shirt soaked red with blood and her eyes bugged out. <gasps> what the hell happened? <laughs> My mind retraced through everything that I had just witnessed. Her face. Her face. They took her face. It came right off. Both my parents looked equal parts concerned and utterly perplexed. I could tell they thought we had just spooked ourselves and gotten hurt running away. I waved my hands at Spencer to silence him and then told them everything. As my story unfolded, their expressions wavered between doubt, anger, and concern. Honestly, telling them that Granny Clark had attacked me with a knife and then chased me through the woods before her face peeled off? I had a hard time believing it myself. When I finished, Spencer told his side, When I went through the back door, I, th I should see Will on what I, th I thought was Granny Clark at the front door. I tried to creep around the stairs, but I tripped over a pair of legs. Miss Clark's legs. She was lying in the food pantry. <laughs> I'd never seen Spencer cry before, but his eyes welled up with tears as he continued. Her face was missing. I could see all the stuff underneath. They had pulled it all right off, just like feeling an orange. They took her face. <laughs> My mom disappeared into the kitchen where I could hear her using the phone to call the police. My father stood there shaking his head in disbelief at us. Spencer and I locked eyes. It wasn't Granny Clark on the porch, Will. When I realized that that's when I told you to run. I was so sorry. I hugged him, forgetting the pain in my arm for a moment as he balled his fists up in my shirt and buried his face in my chest, adding his tears to the blood and sweat that I was thoroughly soaked in. I'm so... I'm so sorry. When the police got to Abigail Clark's house, they found her just as Spencer had described. Her throat had been slit, and all of the flesh on her face had been removed. In the woods, they found the remains of her face, cut from ear to ear and worn like a mask. They also found my stuffed parrot lying in the leaves by a blood-covered tree at the turn that had saved me. One of the branches on the tree was snapped and dripping with blood. Even more was found where the path opened out onto Juniper Street. But after that, the trail went cold. 
They found the killer a day later, an unemployed carpenter from two towns over with a history of violence. He checked into the hospital with a gouged out eye claiming he had accidentally impaled himself while hanging a picture. Apparently his blood work came back with two different types on him, one of which was identified as Abigail Clark's. Thankfully, he confessed, saving the police from having to ask Spencer or I if we could identify him. Neither of us would have been able to, and neither of us wanted to ever see him again. I do see him, though. Regularly. Whenever the scar on my arm flares up and my dreams turn to running down that moonlit trail in the woods with him just ten steps behind me. Of course, the face I see isn't his. It's always Granny Clark's face, devoid of emotion, yet every step filled with anger, determined to catch me and put me in the ground. Granny Clark, the most beloved person Hollisfield has ever known, is the monster that haunts my worst nightmares.